Welcome back to the channel. Starting a business can be challenging and often expensive. While some can get up and running with little or no money, others require massive amounts of capital before they start to make a profit. In some cases, banks provide loans to help entrepreneurs get ideas off the ground. But which bank in the right mind would give millions of dollars to a couple of guys who wanted to put airbeds in other people's living rooms? Luckily for the founders of Airbnb and countless other startups, the venture capital industry exists. In 2019 alone, Investor ploughed over $200 billion into high growth startups in the hopes of getting into the next Facebook or Google at the ground floor. It's become a huge industry, but that wasn't always the case. How did we get here? How has the industry evolved? And what might the future of startup funding look like? That's what I'll be looking into in today's episode. Let's go back, way back to the beginning of the 20th century, when startup funding looked a little different than it does today. Back then, entrepreneurs looking to start businesses had a few options when setting up. Of course, the first option was to start with what little you had, buying and selling products, and expanding by reinvesting your profits and leveraging credit from suppliers. Another common method was to approach the local bank manager with a dream and a business plan to explain how you are going to return their money. Banks are naturally risk averse and therefore would only tend to loan to the companies that could start paying back their loan almost immediately, think bakeries or merchants. Top this up with a guarantor and some fun from family and friends and you're in business. These methods of course still exist today and remain the best startup funding strategies for many industries. Because everything needs a trendy name nowadays, it's referred to as bootstrapping. But what happens if the business you want to create requires a lot of research and development up front? Or maybe requires a lot of money to get off the ground? There certainly weren't, and still aren't, many banks out there looking to give millions of dollars to teenagers with no credit history, track record, or likelihood of repaying anything for years, let alone in the next few months when it's needed. Another funding strategy was required. Let's take the story of the Ford Motor Company as the early example of how it was done back then. Henry Ford was a talented engineer with an interest in evolving technology known as the combustion engine and how it could be applied to personal transport. In his free time, using money from his job at the Edison company, Ford made a working prototype of his invention, called the automobile. The idea was cool, but it certainly wasn't a feasible business yet. He needed backers, and the banks weren't interested in this level of risk. Step up, Alexander Malcolmson. Malcolmson was an old friend of Ford's and a successful businessman in the coal industry, he believed in the vision and together they formed the creatively named Ford & Malcolmson Limited. It was a 50-50 ownership. The initial automobile was more expensive to develop than expected, so the company was forced to raise more money from other Detroit business leaders. But soon, it would all become worthwhile. In 1908, Ford began production of the Model T, which would go on to sell millions of cars and make its founders and early investors very, very wealthy. It's a great story and one I'd like to tell in the future, so if you want to hear it, let me know in the comments. But back to startup funding. Even in the 1900s, it was possible to get your big startup idea funded, but only if you had years of expertise, a groundbreaking idea, and happened to be friends with some of the most successful businessmen in the country. Oh, and you probably had to give your first backer half the company. Basically, it was a hobby for the supremely rich, and very few aspiring founders benefited from it. It would take another 50 years for someone to begin opening up opportunities to a wider base. When World War II came to a close, thousands of talented people returned from the front line with an American dream to build a new life for themselves. At the same time, a few new venture capital firms were founded with the goal of funding these dreams with new sources of capital. American Research and Development Corporation and J.H. Whitney & Co. were the pioneering firms in the industry. ARDC was founded by Harvard professor Georges Doriot, who believed there was an opportunity to make startup investing possible for a greater group of people. His innovation was to take the existing venture tradition created by the wealthy families and make an institutional investment product out of it. On the other side, Jacques H. Whitney is widely credited with creating the first true venture capital firm. In the early days after founding, Whitney surrounded himself with a team of 13 partners whose experience spanned finance, business, law and academia as well as 20 additional support staff to help with due diligence and support the founders of business activities. Several other firms started around the same time period, trying to capitalise on the opportunity to fund America's future. It was at some point around this time that the term venture capital was first coined. Now, during the 1960s and 70s, VC firms focused their investment activity primarily on starting and expanding companies. More often than not, 
these companies were exploiting breakthroughs in electronic, medical or data processing technology. ARDC is credited with the first major venture capital success story when its 1957 investment of $70,000 in the Digital Equipment Corporation would soon be valued at over $35.5 million after the company went public 11 years later. That's a return of over 500 times the original investment. Soon, venture capital became pretty much synonymous with the financing of new tech. There were some success stories of this time, but many of these early firms failed to properly incentivize their partners or startup founders, leading to some poor returns overall. There was clearly opportunity, but still a lot to figure out. Encouraged by emerging technology and some of the early success stories, new firms entered the market with a focus on properly aligning founders, VCs and limited partners. 1972 saw the creation of two very notable firms, Sequoia Capital and Kleiner Perkins in the Santa Clara Valley. They were perfectly located to capitalize on a very exciting new technology, spun off from another early venture capital success story. In 1968, three top engineers resigned from the VC-backed Fairchild Semiconductor and started their own company, Integrated Electronics, which you might better recognize today as Intel. By 1971, they had invented the first microprocessor, the Intel 4004, which would soon bring about the dawn of computers and the renaming of Santa Clara Valley to the famous hub of technology, Silicon Valley. The aforementioned venture capital firms helped finance the companies that brought about the revolution, with Apple and Compaq being standout success stories. It's important to highlight at this point to any entrepreneurs watching right now that venture capital is certainly not the be-all and end-all. Often you can achieve so much more by holding on to your equity and stealing on revenue. Take Bill Gates' Microsoft story. So uh, when you started, uh, how did you avoid what so many other entrepreneurs are unable to avoid, which is taking venture capital money and diluting themselves? You didn't really take venture capital money. How did you avoid that? Yeah, we got software, if you can sell it in volume, has extremely favorable economics. So we, we didn't have to build any factories. Uh, we were cash positive, and we didn't have a year where we lost money. Uh, you know, the first few years, okay, Paul and I worked for free, Paul Allen, who was, who was my co-founder. But after that, we were just generating cash. We eventually gave away or sold 5% of the company uh, for a million dollars, so a 20 million valuation, just to get a venture capital company uh, to join our board and give us some adult advice. That money sat in the bank. It's still in the bank today. So it was not for anything to do with capital, but rather just to join the team. And he's still on the board. Yep, he's still on the board, Mike's up, and is still extremely helpful as a lot of uh, important decisions get made. The story highlights two things. Firstly, founders are often better off in the long run if they scale naturally through revenue generation, if that is an option for them. Secondly, venture capital could be about so much more than just the money. This would be an early sign of developments to come. Back in California, things were heating up. Following impressive returns on early tech companies and the emergence of a new age of information broadcasting, investor dollars were flowing into the valley. Couple this with increasingly low interest rates, and suddenly venture capital was widely available, particularly if your startup had .com in the name. The internet had arrived, and people were excited, like really excited. In the mid-late 90s, people flooded to the valley to make their fortunes and build a slice of the future. The internet promised to change everything, a business who could only target customers in its area can now target customers globally. You can listen to your favorite sports team play, even if you were in a different state. The possibilities were endless. But what about profits? Yeah, we'll figure that one out later. For the first time, capital was widely available to almost any founder that wanted it. Elon Musk and his brother arrived in the valley with the goal of raising $10,000 for 25% of their new internet company. They instead got $3 million. Companies less than two years old were being listed on the stock market and seeing their valuations triple in their first day. The hype pushed the markets higher, with the Nasdaq technology exchange doubling and then tripling. Dotcom millionaires and billionaires were being made overnight. It was truly a modern day gold rush. Then it all came crashing down. While the initial speculation was absolutely justified, things had become quite ridiculous by the time the new millennium came around. Companies were doubling their value simply by mentioning internet in their future plans. Three people in a room with a basic landing page website were launching on the stock market and raising millions of dollars with no revenue or plan of profitability. Many investors had a fear of missing out and fundamentals went out the window in the process. 
hundreds of companies closed their doors for the final time, including eToys, which burned through $800 million of investor money in just three years before declaring bankruptcy. Fortunes were made and fortunes were lost. Some investors made a killing while many, many more got burned. By 2002, the Nasdaq had lost 80% of its value. So, would this be the end of venture capital financing? Not even close. While companies around them were filing for bankruptcy, many survived through the crash. Amazon, Google, and several others overcame the struggles to become some of the most valuable companies in the world today. The dot-com bubble influenced and accelerated a few major changes in startup funding, bringing technology and venture capital into the mainstream. Most importantly, capital was widely available in the space for the first time, meaning VC firms had to start offering more than just money to get on the cap table of the hottest startups. The modern era of startup financing can be somewhat complex and definitely deserves its own video. I'm hoping to do three parts in this series, telling the story of the past, present and future of startup funding and what you can do to get it. So subscribe with notifications on if you want to hear more about it. For now though, I've been Johnny, telling the background stories behind entrepreneurs and startups before they were well known. These videos take a lot of time and research, so if you wouldn't mind dropping a like or sharing with a friend who wants to know more, it really really would help the channel. Speaking of which, thanks for 150 subscribers. Keep hustling guys, hopefully one day soon I'll be telling your tale and stories of success.